Okay, good evening, everyone. Happy Tuesday, happy sunshiny spring day. Uh, welcome to the Grimsby Heritage Advisory Committee meeting. I will begin uh, with a land acknowledgement. The Niagara region and Grimsby is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hanarendarok, the Hananashane, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The regional municipality of Niagara and Grimsby stand with all indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the land on which we live. Thank you. Any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Doesn't look like it. I will move on to uh, the approval of the agenda. Do I have a mover for the agenda this evening? Councillor Christangi. All in favor? Carried. Next up is the receipt of the minutes from February 13th, 2024. A mover? Brian, perfect. All in favor? Great, that's carried. Uh, next is our first of a few verbal updates. We have a uh, update for 251 Murray Street, a removal request update that Bianca will share. Go ahead. Thank you through you, the chair. Um, I know the committee was made aware, but just for everyone, uh, we wanted to confirm that the demolition request for the property was withdrawn um, and the property owners have asked for more to uh, work with staff, the committee and council um, on the protection of the site, incorporating um, a potential modern layer in the future. So um, they've just asked for more time and they understand with Bill 23 that we have to have something by the end of the year. So um, they, they wanted to work with us. So that was just an update for everyone. That's great. Thanks, Bianca. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, we'll go ahead then to uh, 292 Main Street West. Oh, I have to do an, a verbal update. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yes. Uh, okay, then. I have a to receive then that verbal update regarding 251 Murray Street, the removal request update be received. A mover. Councilor DeFlavio. All in favor? That's great. Thanks. That's carried. All right. Now we can move on to 292 Main Street West, the OLT decision update. Go ahead. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, so we've received the OLT decision on 292 Main Street West. Um, and they, uh, this was again for a severance in the front yard. Um, and so the uh, proposal was a severance in the front yard and a severance in the backyard and then the designation of um, Swallowbeck 2. And so uh, the Ontario Land uh, Tribunal decision was that Swallowbeck 2 be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, they also required that an easement be put on the heritage site and the, the uh, site in front. So they did permit the front severance as well to allow a structure to be built in front of Swallowbeck. And as a mitigative measure, they have given um, an easement agreement. And so we're still working with um, the Ontario Land Tribunal to finalize that easement. Um, but the intent of the easement is that uh, whatever is built is compatible, distinguishable, and subordinate to the heritage building. Um, and um, that is what we're still um, working on. So that's the update at this point. Um, and so that's everything. Okay, thank you for that uh, that update. Any questions from the committee regarding? Okay, I, I had I wanted to just clarify. So the easement is for the front yard severance, but not the backyard. Through the chair, um, we're still working on the details of what that easement is. Yeah, I can't I can't really confirm at this point because we're still waiting for direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you for providing that update then. I uh, have a resolution here then for the verbal update regarding 292 Main Street West OLT decision be received. A mover, 
Amy, awesome. All in favor? That's great. That's carried. <clears throat> All right, next is an update regarding Heritage Week, which took place back in uh, February, and it looks like Garrett's going to give us that update. Thank you through you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so we celebrated Heritage Week uh, February 18th to the 24th, and we took the opportunity to invite the Grimsby Planning Department out to the school, uh, Willowbank School of Restoration Arts. We have a partnership together, uh, and we used the week to uh, teach about heritage practices, uh, the value in restoring items, and everybody got to try their hand at restoring some of the artifacts from the museum. Uh, so during that week, we completed the restoration of a railing from an original Grimsby Beach cottage. We've restored one of the time clocks that's in the museum. Uh, we also restored a couple wooden windows, and we gave a bit of a demonstration on how to repair these windows, the value of keeping them in the buildings, um, why they're important. And we also restored two corbels that came off of a uh, demolished building in town as well. So it was a great opportunity for everybody to try their hand out uh, the trades and restoring artifacts. Oh, and yeah, yeah. we also uh, partnered, uh, we did a social media post uh, partnership with the uh, Grimsby Historical Society and the Grimsby Museum as well, and Nell's Manor. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks for that, Garrett. I, you know that I saw that the social media posts across across Craze Facebook and Instagram, and it was really, really cool to see the, you know, the research that uh, you have found through your designation research reports being shared with the general public uh, through social media. And it was really interesting to see, you know, the comments and just how they were shared and how they kind of sparked conversation online. So that was really ni nice to see. Uh, and in regards to the Willowbank partnership, I think that's really cool. It's a really cool way to. You know, bring this tangible heritage, work with the students at Willowbank who are our next generation of heritage professionals. It's actually exciting. Um, but I am curious, so were all of the, the things you worked with, were they all part of the Grimsby Museum or were some, or are some of those like gonna go back into Grimsby Beach? Uh, through you, Chair, they were all items that came from the museum. Yeah, thank you. That's really awesome. And then there's a little partnership with the Guernsey Museum too. I love this. This is great. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Awesome. Okay, thanks, Garrett. I have a resolution then uh, that the verbal update regarding Heritage Week be received. Mover, Brian, thank you. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay, next up is uh, working group updates that I will I'll share a little bit of an update there. Um, so you'll, re you'll recall from the past couple meetings, we've talked about creating a outreach and education working group. Um, we've had some time to just, we had to go to clerk, see what that would look like because we are such a small committee, but it does look like we can have um, a working group of three committee members or less. So just a tiny group, uh, but we are able to invite other groups in the community to work on this project with us. Uh, so we have the go ahead to reach out to the Grimsby Historical Society, the Grimsby Museum, um, other heritage interest groups in, in Grimsby uh, and, and work on this outreach and what that would look like. And it's pretty broad right now. We've talked about using social media. We've talked about, you know, walking tours or brochures or something to leverage the research that has been created through the designation research reports. Um, now actually bringing that into the public with through an education or outreach or some sort of engagement with the community. So now that we have that go ahead, uh, I will be emailing the committee uh, sometime soon uh, to talk about who's interested in joining that committee. I don't want it to be super onerous, but just to get us together, we'll probably meet some at town hall. I'd ask you know to book a space here. And then I would reach out to the Grimsby Historical Society and the museum and whoever else is interested and maybe get a couple representatives so it becomes more of a collaborative project. So we can look out uh, for that. Hopefully I can get that started sometime this month. Any questions, comments? Okay, awesome. Okay, that's great. Thank you guys. Uh, so then I have my resolution here that the verbal update regarding working groups be received. A mover. Brian. All in favor? 
That's carried. Okay, I'm looking forward to getting that going. All right, moving on in the agenda, uh, we have a, a few requests for comments. Uh, the first will be for uh, 2 6th Street, and I'll hand that over to Bianca to get us started. Thank you through the chair. Um, so we do have the applicant here in the Heritage Consultant. So I'll invite um, Arnell, um, if you have a presentation or did we, were, were we gonna share it for you? We might be, hold on. Okay, perfect, Christy's here. I'm just gonna share the screen for you. Can you see that okay, Chris? Yes, thank you. And, and Ben Dobb from LHC is also here and he'll be running through the presentation, but I'll be available to answer questions as well. Perfect, and I can see it too. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, as Chris said, I'm uh, Ben Dobb. I'm a heritage planner with LHC. And I'm just here to present a little bit uh, about our heritage impact assessment that we prepared for 2 6th Street. And go to the next slide. It's a PDF, so you can probably just scroll down. Okay, so 2 6th Street is in the northwest section of Grimsby Beach uh, per the secondary plan of Grimsby Beach. So the red dot on the uh, left hand image shows the location. And then the image on the right hand, you'll see two boxes there's the red box and there's the green box. So 2 6th Street is the red box and the green box right below it is uh, an adjacent heritage property that's listed under section 27 uh, part four of the heritage act next slide so a bit about the project so lhc was retained in august 2023 to prepare uh, an hia as i was mentioning uh, the hia was reviewing the proposed demolition of the current building on the property and the subsequent development of a new house. So the image uh, shown on here is the current house on the property that will be demolished uh, and, and replaced. And as I was mentioning again, uh, the HIA was triggered by the property's adjacency to 46th Street, uh, which is listed under section 27 and directly to the south of this property here. So 2 6th Street and 4 6th Street, the adjacent property, uh, are located in land in Plan 64, which was created as part of an expansion to Grimsby Beach Park in 1885. Uh, the house at 2 6th Street was built circa 1964, uh, well after the park's closure. Uh, in LHC's professional opinion, the property at 2 6th Street uh, does not meet any criteria for cultural heritage value or interest from Ontario Regulation 906, and it's not a potential cultural heritage resource at all. And the house at 4 6th Street uh, was likely built between 1885 and 1910 during the park's growth and development era, which was particularly prominent uh, between 1880 and 1890. Uh, or during the amusement park era, which took off uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So for 6th Street, we evaluated against uh, Ontario Regulation 906, strictly for the purposes of articulating likely heritage attributes uh, against which we could assess the proposed development on 2 6th Street. Uh, we determined that the property has historical value or associated value because it is directly associated with the Ontario Methodist Campground Company or Grimsby Beach, uh, the Grimsby Beach Park rather, uh, and its expansion uh, through 1885 through the creation of Plan 64. 
Likewise, the property has contextual value because it is important in maintaining uh, and supporting the character of the Grimsby Beach area, specifically its northwest area, where there are fewer uh, of these uh, Grimsby Beach cottages. So the likely heritage attributes uh, that we determined for 4 6th Street uh, include the house on the property, so specific to the house here. Uh, it's rectangular lot configuration composed of four individual lots determined through Plan 64. Uh, it's shallow setback from 6th Street, rectangular floor plan, one and a half story height, front gable roof, and it's multi-story porch. Uh, so these are attributes that we see uh, fairly commonly uh, with these types of buildings in Grimsby Beach. And again, we just determined these for the purposes of articulating uh, specific items that we could assess the proposed development at 26th Street uh, against. So on the screen now is just photos of the proposed development. So we have an elevation uh, on all sides. Uh, and what we see here, uh, the development itself is very similar in terms of form, scale, and massing to the building that's currently on the property. So we have a rectangular floor plan, two-story height. Uh, these are both consistent with the current property or the current house on the property um, and consistent with the, the general area. Uh, same with materials. So we have proposed as board and batten. It doesn't show it on these drawings, but we have a, an engineered board and batten siding going on here and then obviously uh, gabled roofs, which are common and, and um, pretty ubiquitous throughout this area and the development in the area. So uh, overall, the new building is not very different from what is currently uh, observed on the property at all. So in terms of impacts to the adjacent property specifically, uh, so we used info sheet uh, number five from the Ministry of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. So uh, we determined no destruction at all, no alterations to the adjacent heritage property uh, or its likely heritage attributes that we determined. Uh, no shadows, isolation, or direct or indirect obstruction is expected at all. Again, this proposed building is very similar to what is already on the property. So it's gonna yield no change regarding what is there now versus what will be there. Uh, and no changes in land use. We're going from a residential house to a residential house. So a one for one trade there. And then no expected uh, land disturbances at all uh, expected here. So overall, uh, no impacts uh, to that adjacent heritage property at 4th Street. And next slide. Thank you. And just to conclude, uh, it's LHC's professional opinion that the property at 26th Street does not meet any criteria from Ontario Regulation 906 and is therefore not eligible for individual designation under Section 29, Part 4 of the Heritage Act. It is also LHC's professional opinion that the proposed demolition of the property currently on 26th Street and development of a new single detached house will not result uh, in adverse impacts to the potential heritage attributes of the adjacent heritage property uh, at 4 6th Street. And that is all for me. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ben. Uh, does anyone in the committee have any? Oh, sorry. And then we have Bianca's going next. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, through the chair, I was just going to give a summary of staff comments, um, and then you're, uh, then you everyone can have their discussion. Um, so after reviewing all the submitted materials, heritage planning staff have concluded that they are supportive of the minor variance application and the proposed two-story single detached dwelling and find it to be compatible with subordinate to and distinguishable from the adjacent heritage resources. Um, and we also found it to be very compatible with the overall character of the Grimsby Beach area. Um, and we also wanted to note that efforts were made um, during the development of this plan um, to have similarities to the Grimsby Beach style while still enabling it to be a product of today um, and having it be very clear that it is not an original Grimsby Beach cottage, but it still very much fits in with the overall character. Um, staff further concluded that the uh, proposed um, 
development was in keeping with the town's official plan policies within the Grimsby Beach Secondary Plan area and the Urban Design and Heritage Guidelines. And uh, we found that there was no adverse impacts to the adjacent um, heritage resource and as noted, the overall uh, Grimsby Beach um, site. And so um, staff is supportive of, of the application and will be providing comments to the Committee of Adjustment and staff is recommending that um, the committee endorse those comments and that they be shared with the Committee of Adjustment. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for providing those comments, Bianca. Um, at this point, does anyone in the committee have any questions or comment? It looks like no uh, no comments here. I will say I, I do appreciate um, how much effort has been taken to ensure the new designs are compatible with the Grimsby Beach neighborhood, the history, um, the site adjacent to. So I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. I guess with that, we'll go through, we'll go to the, the resolution then. Uh, resolved that the committee endorses the staff comments within the heritage analysis of proposed minor variance application at 2 6th Street memorandum and that the comments be submitted to the committee of adjustment. Uh, do I have a mover? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Councilor DeLavio. Sorry, Chair, through you. I, I'm, I'm sorry to make you have to read that again afterwards, and I'm fine with the, uh, If you don't have to, then that's fine. It's through you to uh, Bianca. So we've heard repeatedly, and I, I, I just don't know the philosophy behind it, so I'm just curious because you folks are heritage experts, so I, I just want to know the, to understand the reasoning why. We've heard uh, to build it in, you know, that's sort of in the style of the, the heritage homes, but so that it's distinctly new. Why not build a heritage home in a heritage neighborhood that looks like a heritage home that has been there for 100 years? I, I, the, the ones that are of heritage value and that are designated will, are signed and, and clearly uh, separate from the new homes, but if you want to protect the character of a neighborhood, why not ask the new construction to look as close to as possible the existing heritage homes? I, it, I'm sure that there's a really good reason behind it. It's just never been explained to me because I've, I've understood where you want the opposite, where you want something modern that is very distinct from, you know, it, it's the same philosophy for additions, for example. You know, some people believe that putting an addition on a heritage home should be very different from the, the heritage home itself. So it's very distinct what's of heritage and what, what's heritage and what's not. Is that the same idea for a new heritage home in an existing heritage neighborhood? So through the uh, chair, um, so best practice is that it be compatible with subordinate to and distinguishable from. And I kind of see it as a spoke, it should be equal parts. Shouldn't lean too much one way or the other. Um, and the other piece is you really want the heritage buildings to be able to stand proud and not have to compete with adjacent buildings. So if you have something that's too compatible next to it, um, then the heritage building isn't standing out, it's competing with. So when modern, um, development is brought into a site, um, you really want to tone it down so that the heritage, if there's a heritage building on the site, that that's the showpiece and that it's not competing for the attention. And that's the same in the Grimsby Beach area. You would really want it to be um, something that's different so that when people are walking around, they can see what are the original ones and then what is the product of today. So that's best practice is to have that um, distinguishability and, but you still want it to be compatible so you can see with the proposal. It's little, it looks like a product of today, but they have introduced some of those peaks to just help it kind of be compatible with the adjacent buildings, but it's very clear it's not an original Grimsby Beach Cottage. That was a great question. Thank you for, for answering that, Bianca. Any other questions? Yes, Brian, go ahead. Through you, Chair. Um, it, just curious, as I know this neighborhood is, is uh, there's a lot of people in this very passionate homeowners. Does this, does something like this also go to the out to public comment, or has that happened already? I'm just more of a curious question of if that's something where the the neighborhood will have an opportunity to weigh in on um, this proposal. Through the chair, um, yeah. So the minor variance application is a public process, and. Um, 
people within the area will be circulated and provided notice. Um, there's also a sign that's posted on the property and then it's also um, live streamed. And um, yep, everyone's welcome to send in comments um, on it. And then the other piece is we did the Grimsby Beach Secondary Plan and the Urban Design and Heritage Guidelines. And the Grimsby Beach community was very involved in that process in the development of those guidelines. Um, and so they were able to provide a lot of feedback at that phase. And so we're, we're really following those tools now, those great tools that have been put in place, so. That's a good question. So the guidelines that, were, that this is following were pretty much like developed in line with, the, with what the community were, was looking for in the first place. Yeah, it's through you, the chair. This is really the first time we're seeing um, the kind of product of the Grimsby Beach Secondary Plan. Um, so there's new policies within our official plan that speak to the preservation of the Grimsby Beach area. Um, and paired with that is um, what's called the Urban Design and Heritage Guidelines. And it's a document that accompanies the uh, secondary plan and it, it, it echoes a lot of the industry best practices and things like that. Um, and so the official plan policies ask that new development be in alignment with these guidelines. And I'm, I'm happy to share a copy of all that with, with the committee as well. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I'd like to see that, that'd be great. Um, and so then just to clarify, so this comes to us, uh, then it goes to the committee adjustment and then the community gets to have a say? through the chair. So um, because this is Grimsby Beach, very historic area, we always recommend the applicants to come to Heritage Committee to get comments. Uh, it's not a requirement to come here unless it's actually a heritage site and we need a heritage permit. Um, but we always recommend to the property owners to come here because it helps to have positive endorsement from the committee. And we usually work with them along the way um, to get it um, to a place where staff can support it if changes have to be made. Um, and then with hopes that we go to Committee of Adjustment with positive comments from staff and Heritage Committee. Um, and then the actual community provide comment for the Committee of Adjustment. Mm -hmm. So they're welcome to come to the meeting and register to delegate if they want. If they're not comfortable with delegating in person, they can also send in uh, correspondence. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for, for, for providing that clarification. And yeah, it's kind of cool to see the secondary plan being used then. This is why we made it, so this is exciting. Okay, okay, thank you for, for that little for that discussion. Uh, I'll move on back to the resolution then. Uh, resolved that the committee endorses the staff comments within the heritage analysis of proposed minor variance application at 2 6th Street memorandum and that the comments be submitted to the committee of adjustment, a mover. Amy, and all in favor? That's carried, fantastic. All right, we'll move on then for a request for comments for 3537 Victoria Terrace. And we have a couple people, should I just start? Sure, it's up to me, yeah, there, I can introduce them. We'll get a, Bianca will introduce uh, the speakers through the chair. So I quickly just wanted to touch on this um, and this is a really fantastic um, project here. Um, so this is a cottage that has been in the Barber family and the um, descendants are here today to talk about the history of the site and I don't want to steal any of their thunder so I'm going to pass it over to them but I just wanted to say this is an awesome um, project and something that's so positive for Grimsby Beach so we're really lucky um, to have them here tonight and then we have their heritage consultant and then we also have Wayne here from the historical site to give us some additional information and then we'll have some staff recommendations. Uh, just so you know, Barb, I'm just sharing my screen now for you. That's great, thank you. Okay. My name's Barb Kettle, and I'm George Andrew Barber's wife. And you're going to find out that that Andrew is very important because you're going to meet three George Barbers in the next five minutes. Next slide, Bianca. Grimsby Beach has been important to the Barber family for many years. 
This picture is of Maple Lodge. Those are George's great grandparents on the front porch. And if you look carefully on the left hand side, the lady has a baby on her lap. That baby is George's grandfather. George's grandparents owned a cottage they called Maple Cottage. They summered at Grimsby Beach until the time of their retirement. At that point, they moved there permanently. And George's grandfather remained in Grimsby Beach until about three years before his death when he returned to Toronto to be with family. Not only was George's grandfather at Grimsby Beach, but several of his sons were there. George Cruz Barber, Uncle George, and William Herbert Barber, Uncle Bill, also had cottages at Grimsby Beach. My husband's father, Frank Barber, owned a vacant lot at Grimsby Beach. So you had Grandpa George and his three sons with properties all in a row. George currently has two cousins who are living on Betts Avenue. This is a picture of Grandpa George and his wife, Hazel, and 12 of the siblings and cousins. The other couple were not old enough to sit up by themselves in this picture. They spent a lot of time uh, summering at Grimsby Beach with their grandparents. We know that Grimsby Beach is important to the whole Barber family because we were able to get agreement from all of the cousins and siblings to have this lot that was George's grandfather's lot put in George's name. And if you have a large family, you have some idea of how hard it can be to get agreement amongst everybody. They all wanted it put in my husband's name so that it could be kept in the family. When Grandpa George was in Grimsby Beach, he didn't just live there. He was a very active member of the community, being involved in things like the Gris Grimsby Beach Cottagers Association, being part of Grimsby Beach Limited, being a strong church supporter. He was very concerned about environmental issues, such as the bank erosion and the water quality. And he contributed to many meetings that took place over the years on those issues. During his lifetime, he owned many different properties in Grimsby Beach. During the research that Wayne was kind enough to do for us on the properties, we actually discovered that with 35 and 37 Victoria Terrace, at one point, uh, George Cruz Barber, Uncle George owned one of them, and also George's grandfather actually owned one of them. Although he never lived in it, he did rent the property. And this property remained in the Barber family until 1967 when Grandpa George passed away and the estate, the property was granted on to someone else with, from the estate. Our wishes for the property, and that is 35 Victoria Terrace that has the red arrow pointing to it. 37, unfortunately, is no longer there. We want to restore the original cottage to as close to its former appearance as we can. Uh, that picture would be sometime in the late 1880s, while adding an addition to make it comfortable for today's way of living. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really great presentation, Barbara. That was really interesting to hear the history of, uh, of the site and how important it is to you and your family. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Megan, the, the consultant, who will present uh, a report, and then we'll move on to Wayne, and then we can open it up to discussion, I believe. Uh, so, Megan, if you'd like to go ahead. Uh, are you able to share the presentation? Yes, Megan, sorry, just one second. Okay, great, thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Megan Hobson. Uh, I'm a heritage consultant and uh, Barb and George asked me to do a heritage impact assessment for them, even although they barely needed one because everything they're doing is, is right in line with what you're trying to achieve in Grimsby Beach uh, with people restoring original cottages and making sympathetic additions. 
But nevertheless, uh, it was kind of an ongoing process between um, Barb and George, between Bianca and myself, and also Wayne Mullins, who did a lot of research for them so that they could be accurate in what they were doing. So here we see uh, the site um, with a cottage and an empty lot. So as Barb mentioned, 37 uh, was demolished many years ago. So now there's an empty lot beside them and that is where the addition will go. It's right in the core area of the secondary plan area and it is listed on the heritage register. Next slide, please. It's part of the original layout of the park, uh, lots uh, 25 and 26. So the layout dates to 1875. Uh, and Wayne's research indicates that the cottage uh, that is still standing on uh, at 35, number 35, was probably built around 1877 to 1880. So it was certainly among the first ones that were built there. Uh, next slide, please. So here you get a view of it looking down. Uh, you can see it if you look down uh, 3rd Street uh, and then view beyond that to um, the lake. Um, there's this kind of alleyway that goes down there that is also part of the original layout and has always been there. Uh, next slide, please. This is what it looks like from the front. Uh, there's a kind of a lawn in front and then it goes down to the lake. Uh, and um, Barb and George have just I mean, it probably taken rather costly uh, remediation down there uh, as part of their whole efforts to restore this property to um, good use. So um, uh, the neck, yeah, these still give you a better idea of how heavily altered. So although the original kind of form and outline uh, of the 18, circa 1880 cottage is there with some changes that were probably made in the uh, early alterations made around 1905, probably. Uh, so there's a lot of original material there underneath, but it's it's been heavily altered. So we've got aluminum cladding all over the exterior. The window openings and the windows themselves have been changed. The doors have been changed. So, uh, and of course, <laughs> the porch, uh, the veranda and the uh, open gallery above it are all enclosed in the front. Uh, next slide, please. So that here's just gives you a sense of what it looks like inside. Again, you know, some of the finishes have been pulled off to expose the framing, insulations being added, wood shingles, all kinds of different things going on. Uh, a little bathroom put in that and sort of bump out on the side uh, because originally there wasn't uh, that included. Uh, next slide, please. That's the main, uh, the room on the left, the main room of the cottage. That's what it looks like. There's some sort of later paneling put up, a, a modern fireplace. Uh, and then in the back, we have, again, another modern fireplace and a kitchen put in that little bump out, one story bump out at the back where the kitchen has been. So none, none of this is sort of original, but the spaces themselves are part of the original layout. Next um, slide, please. Second floor. Uh, the, the slide on the left is the, the enclosed sort of upper gallery of the veranda. And then one of the bedrooms in there, the layout, the partition walls have probably been shifted around a bit up there and we've got drywall. Um, there's some original wood flooring, but other than that, everything's pretty um, altered. Uh, next slide, and there's no um, bathroom up there. So, um, we, so I, you know, based on my site investigation, I kind of, and the research that Wayne provided and all the information that Barb and George have, we sort of identified this coordinate original, the red being the sort of 1880 cottage, very typical typology of the Grimsby Beach cottages. Uh, this kind of very simple rectangular plan with an open porch and veranda on the front. Um, and then, uh, the addition in the yellow there is what was, to, was think probably done about 1905. So they added a kind of a a, a side um, decking that went back to this little kitchen at the back. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's what they did when they added on that little addition in the back. And so um, the only sort of original features that I found were these French doors. There's two of them uh, in the front of the cottage, which are now inside the enclosed porch. 
Uh, and then this little staircase at the at the back of the main room on the from between the first and second floor. So um, the idea is, you know, if there's original fabric to try and um, integrate it into the new interior or to salvage it or to, in the case of the windows, to replicate it. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as Barb showed you already, there's this terrific photo and it, uh, it's believed that these this is 35 and 37 here. So you have a pretty good idea of what it looked at, uh, like in about 1886. Um, one thing that, that you do see here is that the, the ground floor is three bays. There are two of these sort of French uh, doors and then uh, another door on the side. So what we have now is two bays. So things have changed a lot in this cottage. So um, putting it all together is, has been interesting. Next side, please. So this uh, nice family portrait here sitting on the steps um, is great, but even more interesting for us is in the background, you can see uh, 35 Victoria Terrace and we can see the side now. And this photo was taken about 1906. And this is why we think these alterations were made just before this picture were, was taken. And you can see that there's a second set of stairs leading up to this little uh, walkway that goes to the back addition now. And you can see there's a door into the cottage on the right and then a door further back into that uh, rear addition that has been built. The other interesting thing that we see here is that the um, the railings have changed on the, the porch. Um, next slide, please. And then the other sort of art uh, historic image that is helping to guide the restoration is this photo uh, taken in 1911. There was a, a fire uh, which which probably caused some damage uh, and you can see there's all kinds of debris there so that may account for some of the account for some of the changes but again it confirms that this little uh, addition on the back was built quite early on next slide please so here are the plans uh, the plan is to build an addition on the side um, and to restore uh, the open um, verandas on the first and second floor and that little bump out on the, the left will uh, be um, a little sort of closet for the interior and there will be um, the decking will kind of come up to there as well, like it had originally. Everything that's shaded blue is an addition here. And then you can just see a little bit at the back where um, the one story addition at the back is now going to be built up to be two stories. So they have more room on the second floor and that just adds a little bit. So. When you see everything here flat, it looks flat, but actually the additions are, are set far back. So when you saw it in perspective, the historic component part of the um, of the cottage will really um, step forward and be prominent. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see it in the plan a little more clearly maybe. So um, you have the original sort of layout of the cottage in the white there and then the darker color is the addition um, on the side and above the second floor and at the back. And then the lighter blue is the new um, veranda and the new deck um, that will be built. Um, Barb and George have also been working with um, a carpenter and a, uh, on creating templates um, for the um, decorative woodwork on the verandas. And they're basing that, I believe, on Maple Lodge, where there are some original um, elements that they can that they can uh, use. And then the door, here's an example of the type of either a new door built to look like this or a salvage door that's very much like what we see in the historic photos. Uh, and the other way in which the additions will be differentiated is by uh, painting the board and batten a different color. So the cottage will, all that horrible uh, siding will come off and new wood board and batten will be put up like in historic photos. The cottage will be painted a kind of a yellow color, a uh, light yellow, and then the uh, addition will be blue. It will be board and batten. So it's going to be an incredible um, transformation, uh, even just with the cladding materials. 
And again, differentiating the old and the new by stepping the addition back, by putting different cladding materials on it. And one of the other sort of details is not to introduce the decorative woodwork on the addition so that you can clearly see it doesn't have that uh, level of historic detail on it. And it's clearly a more modern uh, part of the composition. Um, next slide, please. Right, so that that's um, that's the end of what I have to say. Uh, essentially, I reviewed it. We went back and forth a few times on some of the details, and then we came up with something that was consistent with all of the design guidelines uh, and really is going to be something that really contributes to the Gr Grimsby Beach area and also um, adds a new kitchen, a new bathroom, laundry, all the things you need in order to make this place usable uh, and uh, for you know, a modern family and so that it can continue to be preserved and used. Um, so uh, just, and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, um, I'm just showing you here. Uh, one of the issues is with the placement of the cottage, which is not consistent with the lot lines. And this is very typical in Grimsby Beach. It's kind of a feature of how the site evolved and what was important to them is sort of the, the tr where the trees were located um, were more important to them to where specific lot lines and there was this kind of shared community so it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the same as it is today where they need uh, separate parcels and so one of the issues that the owners are having is that they are now being told that they should move it so that it fits within the lot line. Um, but the, of course, they're gonna ask that they get some kind of exception made so that mm -hmm. allow for it to allow, allow them to keep it where it is because that makes more sense uh, for many reasons. Wayne is here today. I think he's done a lot of research about how the context and the setting is so important. Uh, he, and he's gonna be um, sharing some of that information when when they present their case to leave it where it is. Thanks. That, that's all I have for now. Thank you so much for that presentation, Megan, and for sharing so much more detail about the plans and how and the research that went into it. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll leave uh, questions and comments to the end. So I'll pass it over to, to Wayne Mellons from the Grimsby Historical Society to share uh, what you've compiled uh, for this. Thank you to the chair. Uh, as Megan mentioned, this has been quite an exciting piece of research. This cottage is probably one of the most photographed cottages that we have a history of in Grimsby and both in public collections and in private collections and pulling it all, <clears throat> excuse me, together has actually been able to tell quite a story. I'm going to try and go through these slides as quickly as I can in the interest of time. Um, so if we could have the next slide. So the location of the cottage is actually at the top of the rampway down from the pier as circled in the uh, red box here on this screen. Next slide. And where it was actually Everybody who came to Grimsby Beach uh, to either go to an event or just to camp out or visit came past this property. This was, in fact, Canada's greatest assembly in the 1800s. And if you look at the extracts from the newspapers here, you can see just samples of 13,000 people there in a day, uh, 6,000 people for sports events, 10,000 people for religious service. Um, and that's just a, a sample of the immense crowds that actually did gather at Grimsby Beach in the day. Next slide. That favorite picture again from the 1880s uh, from the Grimsby Historical Society, which is basically out on the lawn in front of the cottage. Right. Next slide. And even up into the 1920s, the crowds still gathered in the area. That's Victoria Terrace going off to the right there. So it was not a fixed roadway. It was a kind of a trail that went through the trees. Next slide. 
The cultural heritage landscape for Grimsby Beach has identified a number of key attributes that are important to linking Grimsby Park with the history. Listed here are the elements for all of the cottages and so on in Grimsby Beach. The ones in the red are particular to this property. And the ones that are underlined have a distinct impact on what we're going to talk about here today. The layout of the street, the placement of the homes, the, the uh, trees and so on. Next slide. So Victoria Terrace and 35 Victoria Terrace in particular was a focal point for the Grimsby Park Chautauqua. It was the location of the access point to the ferry. It's where from the pictures you can see that people rendezvoused, it was a meeting place. It's where they came for group photos and it's where they had the vistas of the lake to walk to actually come out of the park and walk along Victoria Terrace. It was the entrance point. Next slide. But as Megan mentioned, there's an issue with cottage placement on the property. So on the right hand side, you see lot 24, that's actually the roadway that went down to the uh, pier and the cottage itself is on lot 25 there. So you can see the, uh, the north corner of the property extends over the boundary line. Next slide. So what's with this cottage encroachment in Grimsby Beach? Almost every cottage in Grimsby, the original part of Grimsby Beach was outside of the common boundary for good reasons. They're recognized today in the Grimsby Beach uh, Cultural Heritage Landscape document, but we don't recognize it from an ownership of the actual properties for some reason. So if we go to the next slide, you will see the extent of the number of cottages that are actually outside their boundary lines in Grimsby Beach. There's some 50 cottages just in the old section of the Grimsby Beach area alone that are outside their boundaries. So what's the matter with these people? They didn't know how to build a house within boundary lines? No, that's not the case. There's some very good historical reasons why things are the way they are. Next slide. 35 Victoria Terrace was intentionally constructed outside the survey lines when it was built 150 years ago for two reasons. Because of the roadway access to the pier and because of the campground policy about trees. Next slide. So the roadway was a major roadway. The original plan had been for the roadway to go out where the blue X is. Um, so that was Wesley Avenue. But if you look at the angle of the way the hill comes up, it was found that the Wesley Avenue approach was too steep. And so they decided to come off the end of Third Avenue in 1875 when the pier was built. So when these cottages were put in after the pier was built, what did they do? Well, they had to figure that they were going to accommodate the traffic that was going up and down this hill. And what was that traffic? Next slide. So they had heavy passenger traffic, up to 1,800 people a day in the campground. Just to get some scale here, the Grimsby Village at the time was 550 people. If you expanded that out to today's numbers, that would be like having 900,000 people come to Grimsby in a day. So that's the scale of what, of what they were trying to deal with. The other thing that was happening is once the ferries um, steamers started running, there was a commercial freight service that was introduced for, for uh, wheat growers and fruit growers that shipped thousands of tons regularly by steamer. There was a building built uh, down at the foot of the hill to accommodate 50,000 tons of fruit storage at any one time while they wait for the steamers to arrive to keep the fruit out of the sun. So in the early years, that was a horse hill that had to be negotiated to get especially wheat up and down. 
big teams of horses. And later in the 20s, uh, commercial trucks. So it was surfaced with cement uh, to enable that and, and was last serviced in 1921. So just a few more quick slides here, if I could. So we're talking about thousands of people coming on a daily basis to Grimsby Park. Next slide. We're talking about wheat being shipped commercially across to uh, Toronto. And just one, the, the teams of horses needed just to haul one wagon of wheat was significant. And that was a very narrow laneway and hill. Next slide. And this is how the fruit was carried on, on open wagons. So um, this is what they had to deal with when they were doing the planning for, for the park. Next slide. And this is an example of a fruit shipment landed in Toronto on the York Street docks. This is in the 1920s. There was even more fruit being shipped across there in the 1800s, 1890s. Um, so as a result, what did the Methodist campground planners do? Next slide. To accommodate the traffic, they actually allowed 35 Victoria Terrace to be slightly angled to the northeast to allow for the cornering of the horses. If you actually look at the very bottom of that piece, you will see that Third Street there is quite wide at the bottom, and it actually narrowed as it went more towards the lake. So 35 was adjusted in its location, and 33 on the lot on the other side of the roadway was put at the back corner of its lot to enable the cornering that was needed to get access down to the dock. Next slide. And this is still visible in aerial shots from the 1930s when you can see that the roadway went right up against the side of number 35 and on the north end it actually cut over the front of number 33's lot in order to get the, um, especially the commercial traffic up and down to, to, the, uh, to the pier. The next factor, next slide, was trees. So the Grimsby Park Methodist followed a, what was called a Parson Natural Cleric Science, uh, whose belief was that natural science was an extension of the religious work. So if you look at the very top piece there, which is a clipping from the newspaper of the day, there was 100 acres, a large part of it was being maintained in forest with winding walks tastefully laid out. So the Grimsby campground was maintained as a natural parkland in its natural forested state. Trees were preserved. They were only cleared where absolutely necessary. Next slide. So the cottages were actually placed around the trees instead of clearing more trees. And as a result, if your small cottage, which was above the size of the lot, didn't fit the lot, they went outside the boundary. Next slide. So this is what Victoria Terrace looked like. This is right in front of the cottage. This photo was taken in about, 18, or in about 1900. Next slide. And this is in Bell Park in the 1880s. There's actually six cottages built among those trees. So they didn't clear the trees out. They went exactly where the camp lots were. Next slide. So if, if you look at the size of a lot of the camps that were used before the cottages were built, a lot of the camps were essentially almost the size of the cottages. So they basically just put the cottages where the tents fit. Next slide. And even if you had a tree right up against the side of your house, they didn't take it down. They built totally among the trees. Next slide. So with conservation of the natural setting being paramount to the Methodists, boundary line precision didn't matter to them. There was no encroachment in those days because all the land was owned by the Methodist campground anyway. So, and the cottage owners didn't get a deed with a survey description on it. The cottage owners got a 999 year lease with lot numbers on it. 
So the, the residents didn't care, the campground didn't care if the thing was off by a few feet one way or another. We're all going to be here for 999 years, what the heck. Next slide. So what we think should actually happen, being a historic area, is that the Canadian standards for guidelines for conservation of historic places in uh, Canada give guidelines on heritage restoration. And standard one says that you don't move a historic place if its current location is character defining. This place is very much character defining. And the other pieces that you wouldn't remove, replace, or alter intact or repairable character defining elements. We think Grimsby should adopt those standards in use for uh, Grimsby Beach and that the cottage should in fact be able to stay exactly where it is and be granted the right to do so. As a matter of fact, all the cottages that are outside their boundary lines should be given considerations because if you go to repair your foundation right now, chances are you might be told if you have to lift the cottage or change anything, you have to move your cottage and that is not good for preservation purposes. So it's something that strategically should be looked at, uh, but specific to this cottage, I think we can take away some learnings from it and help out the other 50 odd owners also that might face this challenge about encroachment. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for that very thorough research report. Very fascinating stuff. I look forward to talking about it. But first, uh, should we go to Bianca if you have any staff recommendations? Thank you, through you, the chair. Um, Heritage staff are very supportive of the uh, proposal and um, find the new addition, again, to be compatible, distinguishable, and subordinate from the Heritage Building. And um, the property owners have taken such extensive care um, to take that into consideration with um, the distinguishing colors that is uh, considered very high best practice um, to take it to that extent. So I, I commend you on that. Um, they've also ensured that the ornate fretwork remains on the original cottage and having the addition be more um, simple so that it doesn't compete with the heritage building. Um, and they've also uh, stepped back the addition um, to enable the original cottage to stand proud um, and hold its prominence on uh, Victoria Terrace. Um, and I also wanted to note that heritage staff and public works staff are supportive of the encroachment agreement um, for the cottage because of its strong contextual, contextual connection uh, to the shipment history um, in particular. And we think that um, this is a tangible link to that um, longstanding history. And we also think this is an amazing opportunity for education for the greater community. Um, and so we are recommending that um, a plaque be um, put within the encroachment agreement or somewhere uh, within the property so we can tell this incredible story of the uh, shipment history and how this building was purposely placed the way it was um, to enable those horses to still get the speed they needed to get up the embankment and safely get by. Um, so um, we, I wanted to note that. We also um, uh, were in review of the heritage impact assessment, we see the recommendation um, that the property be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act for meeting five of the nine prescribed criteria. Um, and to enable this project to continue forward, uh, staff are recommending that um, as a part of a condition for the minor variance that an easement agreement under the Heritage Act um, be put on the property and that um, it remain with the property until after uh, the work is completed and the property is designated. Um, and this easement will enable us to ensure adherence to the conservation uh, management plan um, and the ensure the long-term retention of the building. Um, it will, now that we know the history, would want to pri prioritize it for bill because of Bill 23. Um, so the easement would give us that opportunity to uh, revisit that once the restoration work is all complete. Um, and then the easement would outline um, that all of the work within the conservation management plan um, would encompass um, the approved works for the uh, easement. Um, 
We also are recommending that a condition be added to the minor variance that all final elevations be approved by heritage staff, a building permit. Um, and as I noted that the uh, encroachment agreement um, include the uh, erection of a plaque outlining the long-standing history of the area's vibrant shipping legacy and the importance of the Slayer being commemorated through the retention of the cottage within its original location. Um, and then in conclusion, um, we recommend that the Heritage Committee endorse the staff comments um, and that an additional memo be provided to Council in, to aid in their discussion regarding uh, the approval of the encroachment agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bianca. Uh, there was a lot there that was covered, uh, so we'll take some time uh, for discussion and comments, and we can start with uh, Councillor DeFlavio. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, so just to clarify a couple of, of items, the, the encroachments on municipal land, is that correct? Through the chair, yes. So maybe I can explain that a little bit. So the encroachment agreement is on uh, the town land, and I can pull up a plan to show you. Um, but as a part of the restoration plan, they're going to have to redo the foundations. And so part of that is going to be potentially lifting up the cottage. And so um, with the cottage being lifted, public works would typically want the cottage to be put back into the private property and taken off the town's land. Uh, but because of that strong link to the shipment history, this is a really strong tangible link that we would um, lose by having the building be put within the property lines. And because of that strong tangible link, uh, heritage staff and public works staff are supportive of it um, being placed um, it within its original location um, and there's a piece of the property and I'll show you I'll put a picture up just to show you exactly how much it's encroaching it's uh, that was going to be my next question was you know how many feet uh, the encroachment was so if, if the picture shows that that's great uh, frankly I would have been shocked if it was not if it was, if it was actually within the boundaries because in our experience and Mayor Jordan's up there too my first meeting of council 21 years ago was over Victoria Terrace and I learned very quickly that there's not one of those properties is really on the property where they belong unless it was torn down and rebuilt. So if we want to preserve any of the actual traditional cottages that are there, uh, we have to be flexible. And so that this, this, is, this makes absolute sense. But I, I'd like to know exactly how much we're talking about and then I have a couple of other questions. Uh, through the chair, this is the plan I have here. Um, I know that um, we are working with public public works right now. They're working on a recommendation report on the exact measurement. That's what I have here. I can go on GIMS to give a rough estimate, but they'll have the actual information. So I'll share that one second. Okay. Uh, while you're doing that, the through you to. Uh, Ms. Hobson, uh, the, some of the images that you showed early in your presentation, I think it was a 1922 image, uh, I think you said that that easterly part of the house, which I, believe, which I think is what we're talking about here as an encroachment, was an addition. Uh, it looked like an additional porch was put on there or stairs were put on there, or am I, am I misunderstanding your presentation from earlier? Because if it was an addition, then removing it would not be a big deal and, and it would get rid of the encroachment issue, or at least partially get rid of it. So. It looks like Barb's going to answer that question. Oh, it looks like you're muted, Barb. When you look at the original pictures, the porch, the original porch did wrap around um, and the staircase was where the staircase is now. The original staircase would have been wood. The one that's there now is cement. But the, in the original picture, when you look at it, the porch did wrap around and down the side. What happened, I think, was that part of that porch was enclosed to create some of that space down the side. But Mr. Mullins could probably speak to that as well. Okay, thank you. Was, was that sufficient? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, that 
I, I thought I, may, I must have misunderstood because I thought that I, I did misunderstand because the, if it was enclosed, then it was already there. It was just, and it wasn't, a, it's not a greater encroachment than the original construction. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the same amount of space. It's just a different way of, of looking at it. This is one of those situations where, and I know that this is in keeping with best practice, but when I saw the picture of the two cottages, the original photo, I know it's a pipe dream, but I would love to see, rather than something set back and distinguished from the building that's attached, I would rather see something that is attached but replicates a second facade so that it looks like the original two cottages. I mean, you could distinguish them by color still, and you could, you know, but I think that we have a picture of what those two, the, the two buildings look like side by side. And I wouldn't be opposed Recording to. stopped. I wouldn't be opposed to uh, seeing something uh, if if a design came, were to come forward with with two build, with with something that looked like two buildings rather than one, but had a setback. I would have no problem with that. I, I, I think that this is one of those cases where if you can replicate something that you know was there, because what you're going to have is a side kind of a side yard. It seems like from the image, it's hard to tell because it's a, it's a two dimensional image. It's hard to tell what it's gonna look like from, from that front. And the front and back down there doesn't mean the same as it did 120 years ago when, when these places were first constructed. Um, but I would love to see a design where there were two, two facades where it appeared like the original two cottages were there and, and distinguished by color rather than what just becomes a, a, a sympathetic addition. But that's, uh, my opinion is just one opinion and, and obviously not, a, I'm not a heritage planner, so. Can I maybe comment on that? Um, the design is based on the design guidelines for additions uh, in this area and they followed the guidelines. Um, so typically a heritage committee would support the guidelines and not ask for something different. Through you, Chair, are those provincial guidelines? Are they, uh, you know, national heritage yeah, guidelines or are they local? Our guidelines. Sorry, what were those? What what were the guidelines? Could you repeat that, Megan or Bianca? Did the Grimsby Beach Urban and Heritage Guidelines? They're your guidelines. So those are the guidelines that again we created as part of secondary plan. Through the chair, yes. So they're a part of the uh, urban design and heritage guidelines, but they are in keeping with the standards and guidelines for historic places in Canada. Um, yeah, and it really speaks to that um, distinguishability and. Yeah, like we talked earlier. Thank you. I'm just trying to learn, so I, I, I'm sorry for delaying the conversation. I, I know I appreciate that question, though, and I think it, this lends largely to what, you know, um, this the heritage conservations or conversations that we're having, right? And there's a, a tendency if you replicate a heritage building, does that, you know, diminish the value of the actual building itself? So those are the questions that I think are involved with do you replicate or do you make it distinguishable? Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, through you, Chair. I, I mean, the extent to which this house is going to be changed respectfully, uh, you know, while, while all the positive external changes are going, like the, the, the change of the siding is gonna look spectacular, um, they are huge changes that are occurring and have occurred over the years, so, to say that building something that looks like a heritage home next to it is going to have is going to diminish it's there nobody's going to look at this home and go oh this is a heritage home that was built 120 years ago in the form that it was built 120 years ago we're you're basically trying to replicate what was there 120 years ago in the reconstruction of this home uh, so you know as much as i understand the guidelines the uh, we can't, let's not pretend that this is gonna be the original home that's there. It's gonna be the shell of the original home with brand new siding, brand new outside, brand new inside, a brand new addition on the, next to it. So uh, again, I, I'm not trying to be overly argumentative, but l let's be realistic about what's happening here, 
right? And, and what's happening is this house is being gutted and the outside is going to try and look like what, what was there 140 years ago, which to, in my opinion, and, and I'm not a heritage professional, I'm just speaking from the perspective of just a person who lives in Grimsby and, and a council member, is not that different than building something new that looks old. That's all. I appreciate that for sure. Uh, Bianca, did you want to respond to Councilor Fabio? Sure, just um, I, I have a rough, uh, rough estimate for the distance. It looks like at the extreme point, it's about uh, 1.25, probably I would first say if I'd say it's probably like 1.5 meters at the most extreme point, yeah, for the encroachment. Um, but yeah, just to speak to that, so um, the way that the um, Heritage Toolkit talks to, so you can have a restoration, you can have a conservation um, approach. And so conservation, you're more going, keeping with what is there and intact, where if you're going with a restoration approach where you're bringing it back to a certain time period, it can't be based on conjuncture. It has to be with 100% certainty. So because the barbers were able to uncover like the siding and things like that, they can actually use those profiles to recreate it. And it's not based on conjecture. It's actually gonna be really close to what was. Um, and so, they have that. They also have a couple of the profiles for what the railing look like, um, and I'm I'm just trying to think of some of the other pieces. But they will have to get as close as they can with the photographic evidence because it can't be based on that conjuncture piece. It has to be 100% certainty for a to be a true restoration. Um, so that's kind of the approach they've gone there, um, and. Yeah, with some of the staff recommendations, some of the recommendations from Megan was again to have that distinguishability, just um, again with the best practices. So just kind of give you an idea of where that approach comes from. And, and I, I see Barbara wants to speak, so I don't want to hold her. Uh, I, I don't want to diminish what you're doing because I think it's spectacular and I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, I think it could serve as an example for what can be done with some of these cottages that will require a great deal of work without tearing them down. So thank you for doing what you're doing. I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think it's gonna look incredible. I, I just also believe that the idea that we can't replicate something that looks in, in, and it's not just your property, it has to do with other discussions that we've had before, that we can't create something that looks like it was built 120 years ago because it might be mistaken for something that was built 120 years ago. I, I just don't like that. I don't like that approach. I, I, I would rather that most of the homes be built to look like heritage homes in that neighborhood to preserve the character of the neighborhood. Because there are so many changes that have occurred over time in the neighborhood that some of those homes are indistinguishable from their original design. So anyway, I, I, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, no, I was just going to say that we're hoping to keep the original board and batten on the inside. Uh, we have been able to uncover some of it, and it is in surprisingly good shape because it has been covered up. Um, we also are going to reuse those French doors on the inside. They're not suitable as outside doors with today's climate. Uh, we are keeping the original staircase that's, that's in the house. And we're hoping to be able to keep the original wooden floors on both the first and second floor. So there are a number of original items that are going back into the house. We've also been able to find a window company that is able to replicate um, those French doors as windows. So they'll be able to, the appearance from the front will be very, very similar to what it is right now, but it will be weather tight. Uh, thank you for, for providing that explanation, Barb. And I think that's really exciting uh, that you're so committed to, uh, you know, uncovering as much of the original material as you can and reusing what you can. I think this is a really exciting project. And I think it's exciting to have, you know, to, for you to be working so closely with heritage planners, with the Grimsby Historical Society. It seems like a really uh, neat collaborative effort. So I, I do want to commend you on that for sure. And working so closely with the design guidelines and secondary plans. So I think this is a, it's, it does seem like a big win for the for the community. So that's exciting. Uh, I also am happy to hear, uh, Bianca, you mentioned that um, there's a heritage easement that will be coming into place. And afterwards, the a designation will come after this. Uh, so I think 
I think that that's good to know that that, that that is already in talks and that we can kind of formally recognize the work that uh, the barbers are doing for for the property, as well as the, the plaque. I'm excited to hear that there will be a plaque uh, because the, the research that Wayne provided about that shipping route uh, is really unique. and. What a tangible, like we have a tangible remnant of that in the encroachment of the, of the property in the, the laneway. So I think that will be really cool. And because it's town property, um, it's easy for us to put a plaque up. So I'm really glad to see that, that we're taking advantage of that. Uh, any other, any questions, comments? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, Mayor Jeff Jordan, I see you have your hand up if you'd like to go. Go ahead. All right, thank you. More, more of just uh, comments and questions. I, I just want to commend everyone uh, involved in this process and, and all the uh, residents of Grinsby Beach, for that matter, because the passion is shown in their presentations tonight and the passion of the community and the community uh, flavor of Grinsby Beach speaks volumes in, in all the work that's done, all the history that's been uncovered, and just the great wealth of history we have in Grimsby Beach and throughout Grimsby. Uh, and it, it just makes me really proud to, to see everyone here tonight trying to, to learn and, um, and to see how much value we have in our historical heritage. It's just, uh, it just really warms my heart. So I just want to thank everyone involved. Thank you for that comment, uh, Mayor Jordan. Uh, any any other questions from, from the committee? Yes, Councillor Christangi, go ahead. Thank you, through Chair. Not so much a question, but thank you, Wayne, for such a great um, delegation on the, um, a different perspective on the, on the history of the encroachment and the way the road is and the tree preservation, because that's not something that we really hear about. And I know uh, the residents in Grimsby Beach are very big on uh, replanting and preserving the trees and stuff like that. So it's really nice to see that piece of history talked about, but also that the residents are still um, taking care of it just as much as they were. So thank you very much for that educational piece. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for that for that comment, Councillor Christangi. Amy, did I see your hand up? Uh, thank you through you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone involved for the care and consideration that went into, uh, into um, what I think is a great example of conservation for Grimsby Beach. Um, quick question, just going back to uh, Wayne's comment about encroachment. Um, and future properties within Grimsby Beach, um, and wondering if we can use this as a case to, you know, take into consideration future properties um, in that area um, if we run into this issue in the future. And this one might be a little bit different because it's on town land. And you know, what considerations are we going to take in the future if it's encroaching on private property? Uh, through the chair, I think this is a really big discussion that we talk about quite a bit in the town. Um, I know. It is very case by case for the town permitting encroachments um, because if there is opportunities for things to be adjusted and things put outside of the town um, property to enable safe traveling and things like that, um, that's something that Public Works has to take into consideration as well. Um, but in this case, we had such a strong tangible link that we were um, able to get support from both Heritage and Public Works staff. I really think it'll be a case by case um, situation. Um, as for encroaching on other property lines, um, I know work's being done through bylaw and things like that to enable people to do uh, maintenance work, um, but it is something we, we deal with quite often and it really is a case by case um, situation, but it's when you have those really strong tangible links and they're defensible that you are able to um, have those those cottages remain in situ, which is always preferred, um, and have that tangible link um, be preserved. And in this case, we're going to be commemorating it, which is really exciting. Thank you for that explanation, Bianca. And great question, Amy. Uh, and any other comments or questions from the committee? Okay, I, I did. I had a question before we move on to the resolution. Um, is there a way to speak more about, you know, ensuring that there is a, a plaque on on the property or the designation? Like, is that something we can build into 
into the resolution or is that come at a later at a later date? I just think it's a really great opportunity and I don't want it to be lost as as this goes forward and as and as things happen. Thank you to you, the chair. Um, so as a part of the um, recommendations to committee of adjustment, uh, there's going to be a uh, recommendation that a condition be added that they obtain an encroachment agreement from the municipality. Um, and so with one of the things that we recommended within the memo um, that we're asking the committee to endorse is that um, a clause be added into the encroachment agreement that um, the plaque be installed on the on the property. Um, and then we can work on the development of the plaque and all of that. Um, but yeah, we're building it right into our memo. It's right in our memo. And then we um, want it to go right into the easement agreement. So we definitely want to make sure it's captured there and really speak to the importance of the education of this tangible link. So yes, it's gonna stay in situ on town land, but what a great opportunity for education, so. Okay, thank you for that. I really, I just wanted to make sure uh, that's great. Um, I think those are my questions. We seem good to move on? Okay, I'll move on to the resolution then. Uh, resolved that the committee endorses the staff comments within the heritage analysis of proposed minor van variance application at 3537 Victoria Terrence Memorandum and that the comments be submitted to the Committee of Adjustment and that the comments be submitted to Council for their information to aid in their decision regarding the encroachment agreement. A mover. Councilor DeFlavio. Uh, all in favor? All right, that's carried. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Okay, moving on then to uh, our first of the reports of the evening. We have a 10 Grand Avenue Herit Heritage Permit application and it looks like Garrett will be presenting on this one. Thank you through you, Chair. The property at 10 Grand Avenue, known as the Grand Avenue Tree Stand, was designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act on June 7, 2010, by Bylaw 1040. The property is owned by the Town of Grimsby. On January 29, 2024, the Town submitted a heritage permit application to install a new window in the existing rear wall of the building. The property occupies a lot on the west side of Grand Avenue. The Grand Avenue tree stand contains a cluster of historic trees and the former Grimsby Beach Hall building. The wooden frame building was constructed in 1935 and was formerly associated with Grimsby Park. The building has been altered over time. These interventions include patchwork, uh, patchworks that have been made to the existing aluminum siding and areas that were previously used as window and door openings as well as a concrete block addition that now serves as the main entrance to the building. This addition is located on the south facade. It is important to note that the hall building is not listed as a heritage attribute on the site. However, a permit, heritage permit was still required due to the proposed works being on the, uh, being on the heritage property. Uh, so the building is currently being leased to the Niagara Region Early Years Program. The application includes the request to install a window on the west facade, which is located to the rear of the structure. The alteration will enable natural light to enter the west side of the structure and is in alignment with best practices. The intervention to the structure and the installation of the new window will improve the use of the building for the current occupants. This type of alteration will encourage long-term retention of the building and improve the function of the space. In summary, staff recommend that the heritage permit application for 10 Grand Avenue be recommended for approval. We'll pull up an image of it shortly. Just working on it. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Garrett, for, uh, for your presentation. And here we have a photo, a picture of 10 Grand Avenue and the proposed window. Any comments or questions from the committee? I'll just uh, give a summary of the image here. So this is showing the rear wall of the building and this is facing into the tree stand. Uh, the building looks pretty similar from the front facade facing Grand Avenue as well. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, I feel like this, um, again, you know, the, the building itself isn't, isn't under, or isn't a heritage attribute, I should say. So I think, I think we all 
can see that this is a viable, reasonable request. <laughs> um, any, any other co comments or questions before I move to the resolution? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, moved then that uh, report HG 240610 Grand Avenue Heritage Permit Application dated April 9th, 2024 be received and that the committee recommends the Heritage Permit for 10 Grand Avenue be recommended for approval. A mover. Amy, awesome. All in favor? That's carried. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, awesome. All right, so next up we have um, a heritage permit application for 5052 Park Road North. And we have a Evan, a heritage consultant, to give us a presentation. So if you would like to head up to, uh, to the podium, um, press the button so that it looks red, and, uh, and then you can go ahead. Uh, good evening, Chair, members of the committee and staff. My name is Evan Sugden. I'm an associate with the Big Leary Group and a heritage planner. Um, I've been retained on behalf of the owner of 50 to 52 Park Road North and 54 Park Road North. Um, you can see the sketch that's on the screen shows a pretty interesting layout. We actually do not have a, a much of a presentation today. We, um, we've been working with staff and I should note that it's been a really enjoyable process. It's been an open and engaging dialogue, which is not uh, the case in every municipality. So that has been a very fantastic um, interaction for us and for the owner. So they actually have um, a unique scenario, a little different to Grimsby Beach, but they have uh, two existing heritage properties. One of them has two buildings on it. One of them is a separate property with a building attached to the other property's building. <laughs> so you can see the uh, first one, which is the more southern property there, kind of labeled as part two. That is the uh, Gadsby Craftsman House. Uh, and that shares the lot with the Gadsby Shoe Factory, which is the factory to the rear. And it can be seen along the QEW when you're driving. Attached to the Gadsby House is a one-story vict uh, victory home that's actually on a separate lot. So it's attached to the house. That house uh, is a different property altogether. That's 54 Park Road North. It's not the subject of the application tonight. So the purpose of, of this is essentially to propose a severance of the Gadsby Craftsman House from the balance of the lot with, with the factory. Uh, there's no construction proposed. It's simply to help regularize the site so that the owner can determine what to do with the Craftsman House, whether that's resale or keep it. Today it's uh, uh, been converted to a rental unit. There's two tenants there today. Uh, they park to the rear, um, which you can sort of see a little jut out from the driveway beside the factory. The intent is to open up um, what hopefully will become an adaptive reuse of the factory in the fullness of time. And so by having the two buildings on the same lot, it complicates things from that future land use perspective. And so now we want to regularize the lots um, by creating them separate. So the only change that you would notice from the street is going to be the introduction of a new driveway. Um, you'll notice in our HIA, we originally set out some recommendations to limit the width of that driveway. The intent of that driveway width was to do two things. Provide a separation from the existing tree that's um, in the sort of western edge of the, of, of the Craftsman House. Uh, thank you for zooming in. And then B, to provide adequate separation from the existing fence post or the gate post that's there, which is a part of the factory property. We've actually recommended one and a half meters to provide landscaping as well, so that way snow can go when the driveway maintenance is undertaken. And so the, the recommendation was to avoid the gate post and avoid the tree. And so we've actually been discussing uh, with our planner, Matt, and with planning staff. Planning staff have brought to our attention that the requirement from a zoning perspective is actually two parking spaces. Uh, for each dwelling unit. And because there's already two existing tenants, we've altered the recommendation to comply with zoning and to com you know, provide enough space for the existing tenants in the house. Um, and we've drawn out a sketch for your reference that shows it can still, with this wider width, avoid the tree and the gate post. So that's the, the change noticeable from the street. Whereas parking is now to the rear, it will be in the front uh, if this were to be approved today. 
and that's it. And we do agree with staff's recommendations, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Evan. Uh, Bianca, did you have any any like staff recommendations? And then we can have a conversation. Yep. Okay. Thank you, through the chair. I'm just going to leave this up um, just because I wanted to touch on one thing that we talked a bit about with um, Evan and their team. Uh, one of the things we really wanted was to have the uh, gate posts stay with the factory. So they were really great and working with us uh, to accommodate that. So you'll see um, that the uh, gate has been left with the factory, which we think is great. Um, and um, I just, overall, we were very supportive of the application to enable the adaptive reuse of the factory in the future, but also to have such a great use for the um, Gatsby house there and ensure its long-term viability in the future. Um, so we were support supportive of the um, the uh, severance and um, as a part of that, we will now have to update the designation bylaw. Um, so because of us amending the designation bylaw, there is an appeal period. So just to reduce any uh, vulnerability, we are gonna be recommending that we place an easement under section 37 of the Heritage Act on the property so that we can, um, and the easement is uh, between the town and the property owners. So they would have to be supportive of it, which they are. Um, and so we'll put the placement, place the easement and then uh, we'll amend the designation bylaws to reflect the change, then we will um, go through that process, get approval from council, um, and then once the appeal period ends for the designation bylaws, we're recommending that that easement be lifted because the um, uh, designation provides adequate protection to the site. The additional easement is not required. It's just um, to enable uh, protection within that vulnerable period. So um, that's the staff recommendation. Um, and yeah, happy to answer any questions. Bianca, may I add to that, if it's possible, through the chair? Uh, through the chair, um, we do agree with the temporary conservation easement, um, to Bianca's point, but would just ask for the record, specifically just for the minutes, that uh, staff continue the open dialogue with us and work on the wording together in terms of how that's uh, the verbiage in that temporary conservation easement. Through the chair, um, yes, I, I, I have the resolution uh, put here, but maybe we can add that in. Um, and the other thing I also wanted to add was that, again, we recommend that the committee uh, endorse our comments and the recommended conditions um, to be brought to the land division committee. That's one piece I forgot as well, but yeah, we can amend that. Right now it says that um, after the 30 day appeal period that we will lift it. So I know that was an important thing that we had talked about making sure it comes off after. Um, but yes, both parties will have to agree to the extents of the easement. So we can definitely add that in mm -hmm. through here or in the minutes, so yeah. That sounds good. We can discuss that when uh, maybe I can, when, when again it's time for me to read the resolution, we can make sure that we're all okay with, with the language there. Um, this this is this is great. It's good to see uh, you know us working the town and, and you guys working together on this. This is exciting. Um, any any comments or questions from from the committee? Okay, it looks yeah. I mean again, um, you, I think it's been quite thorough about protecting the heritage resources themselves. Uh, um, and, and I do appreciate the consideration that went into the gates being, you know, severed with the factory property and the consideration for the tree and the walkways and, and protecting, you know, the, the frontage of the craftsman house. So I do, I do appreciate the consideration that's been put into, into protecting uh, the heritage assets on, on these properties. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, it looks like there's no questions. So I guess I'll, I'll read the resolution and if we're okay with the language then we can go ahead. Uh, so I'll do that now. It's a long one. Uh, okay, the rep uh, so moved then that the um, the report HG 2407-5052 Park Road North Heritage Permit Application dated April 9th, 2024 be received and that the committee recommends that the heritage permit application to enable the severance of the site and the construction of a new driveway be recommended for approval with conditions and that the com committee recommends that the following conditions be included within the heritage permit. A, that a heritage easement under section 37 of the Ontario Heritage Act be registered on title prior to amending the designation bylaw, and B, that the heritage easement under section 
Section 37 of the Ontario Heritage Act be removed following the completion of the legislated 30-day designation bylaw appeal period. How does that sound, everyone? We might be adding something in. Through you, Chair, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with the factory uh, because I think something really cool could, could really come about on that property mm -hmm. if it was done properly. So, you know, I'm, I have no problem with, with this part of the process, but I'm really looking forward to the next part and what, what's going to come forward in the future. Mm -hmm. I definitely echo that as well. And I think if this, you know, enables the severance enables something really cool to come i'm excited to see what that is uh, sorry we we have an adjustment to the resolution so i'm just going to check in with that what that is Okay, <laughs> we got there. Um, okay, so thank you, Bianca, for adding uh, some additional language to our resolution. Um, I'll read it now, uh, and then if we're all good with it, then we can pass the resolution. So um, after those conditions, we added a section that says uh, that the committee endorses the comments and conditions and that they be included with the memo uh, to the Land Division Committee to aid in their decision, and that... Uh, the committee recommends that staff continue to work with the heritage homeowners on the extents and contents of the easement agreement. How does that sound, everyone? I see some nods. Yes, that's great for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for confirming that, Evan. Uh, with that, then, I'll get a mover uh, from the committee. Brian, great. All in favor? That's great, that's carried. Thank you so much. And I thank you again for your presentation, Evan. Thank you and have a nice night. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we're moving on then to uh, an another heritage permit application. This is for a 141 and 147 Main Street East. And Garrett is gonna take us through that application. Thank you through you, Chair. Uh, the properties at 141 Main Street East and 147 Main Street East were designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act on September 19th, 2022. 
The properties are known as the Brass and Wicker Christmas Cottage and the Book Pettit Coles House. On March 26, 2024, the applicant submitted a heritage permit application to demolish the wooden frame barn behind the dwelling at 141 Main Street East and a retroactive approval to remove the modern greenhouse that's located on the properties at 141 and 147 Main Street East. The subject properties are located on the north side of Main Street East between Wentworth Drive and Nells Road North. Both properties are architecturally and, context and contextually contribute to the streetscape and have associations with notable families from Grimsby's past, specifically the Coles Florist and Garden Center, which operated out of both sites since 1986. The barn and greenhouse structures are not listed as heritage attributes on the sites. However, a heritage permit is required to facilitate the alteration of the site as outlined within the Ontario Heritage Act. On July 10, 2023, the Ontario Land Tribunal issued a decision regarding the proposed redevelopment of the properties at 141 to 149 Main Street East. The decision stated that the historic dwellings at 141 and 147 Main Street East are to be conserved and incorporated into the new development proposed for the property. The barn structure located to the rear of the designated property at 141 is a wooden frame, wooden frame structure built on a concrete foundation. The building has a gambrel roof with asphalt shingles and agricultural steel siding. Historical imagery shows that the barn was constructed after 1954 and likely replaced an earlier structure. The greenhouse structures were built between the 1980s and 2000s as a part of the greenhouse operation. It is again important to note that the greenhouses were not included as character defining elements of the designated properties. In summary, staff recommend that the heritage permit applications for 141 and 147 Main Street East be recommended for approval. This will facilitate the OLT decision and that photographs of the barn and greenhouse structures be provided to the Grimsby Historical Society for their records. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Garrett. Any questions or comments from the committee? Okay, it looks it looks like no. Okay. Um, I'll go forward with the resolution then. Um, resolved that report GH2408-141 and 147 Main Street East Heritage Permit Application dated April 9th, 2024 be received and that the committee recommends the heritage permits for the designated properties at 141 and 147 Main Street East be recommended for approval to to facilitate the approved works as outlined within OLT decision and that the materials from the barn be salvaged and are offered to salvage companies to avoid high quality materials from going into the landfill where possible and that the interior and ex in that interior and exterior photographs of the barn submitted with the application be provided to the Grimsby Historical Society for their archives. A mover. Councillor Christangi, thank you. All in favor? That's great. Carried. Thank you. Moving on to a designation research report at 27, 276 Main Street East, and it looks like Garrett will be providing that presentation. Thank you through you, Chair. I just wanted to put a thank you out to the Grimsby Historical Society and Wayne Mullins from Legacy Research for their uh, joint efforts towards protecting these, uh, these structures and doing the research. Uh, I'd also like to note that all property owners have been notified twice of the possible designation of their properties and we have worked with this property owner and they are agreeable to the designation. Based on the assessment of cultural heritage value or interest, staff recommend that the property at 276 Main Street East be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Staff have concluded that the property has met four out of nine prescribed criteria of the Ontario Regulation 906. The property meets the criteria for historical and associative value because the property at 276 Main Street East is directly associated to the Book family who were very early settlers in the history of Grimsby. The Book family first came to Upper Canada in 1797, 
Conrad Book bought their farm the following year from Lawrence Larison. The farm was located on the lakeshore and stretched to Main Street East. 276 Main Street East is the only remaining structure associated with this Loyalist family. At one time, the book properties contained multiple dwellings and a schoolhouse for the book children. The property meets the criteria for contextual value because the scale, mass, and form of the structure is representative of the local vernacular fruit farming estates that were historically found along Main Street East. This parcel is directly linked to the agricultural success of the Book family that contributed directly to the success and prosperity of the town. The parcel is adjacent to the original HG&B streetcar corridor, which is no longer there. Uh, the Book family were notable farmers and utilized a streetcar line to import and export agricultural goods. This property was farmed during the height of the tender fruit farming boom and would have directly contributed to the success of the town. Based on the assessment of cultural heritage value or interest and significant findings, staff recommend that the property at 276 Main Street East be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Garrett. Any comments or questions from the committee? Uh, I had a couple questions, uh, mostly just to just to clarify, uh, so we, we talk a lot about how the, the house was built by Jacob Book Sr. Um, and but then you mentioned some interesting stuff about the Terry Berry family. So they also lived in, in that house. I don't have exactly where it is, but I think you mentioned the, the Terry Berries at some point and how they were, um, I believe they were a teacher or something, they were associated with Park School. I'm just trying to see where that was again. So I, the only reason why I bring it up is I think the Terry Berry history is kind of interesting and I think it, it warrants being included in the, in the 906, um, especially under like the associated value and the historical value. Like I'm picturing in my head, listening to that story and if um, Terry Berry, I'm just trying to look here, um, he was a trustee and, second, and secondary treasurer for Park School. Um, and I'm kind of picturing him like using the uh, HG&B that was right out front of his house and maybe he takes that to go to Park School. Like, I don't know, I think I'm just like picturing something really like fantastical in my head. But like, I just think it gives like a interesting idea of like how that community was like using the space. Uh, and I think, it, I think it does warrant um, being added to the uh, 906. Like, not just the book connection, but the Terry Berry connection as well. Um, I think I, I think it'd be cool to put it um, as part of yeah the associative value and the people, and and then how the neighborhood was used because I, especially since we have that illustration of the the railway like right outside of the house, we know that it was there. Um, we know it was so close to the house, which is really interesting. But so I I, I I just that's something that that I wonder if if you think warrants being being added. Through you, Chair. Yes, thank you for that comment. I do agree that should be uh, should be included in the 906. Just looking at our notes here as well, the the Terry Berry family purchased a parcel off of the Book Farm in 1805. So that is uh, they have had some quite significant uh, time with that property as well, and we'll include it. Thank you. Uh, okay, oh, thank you, thank you. I think that's I think it's exciting, and just again to add, you know, the, the further layers, uh, and to, and so I'm, I'm glad to hear that that like, you think so as well. And I also just wanted to confirm, is, it is mentioned it like one little line, um, but is the house being used as apartments today? Through you, chair, yes. And uh, the designation wouldn't impact the apartments or anything like that. Through you, chair, no, it will be designating the property in its current state. Okay, I just wanted to, to confirm, thank you. Uh, any, other, any other comments or questions from the committee? Okay, uh, awesome. I will move, oh gosh, all my papers are mixed up. One second here. Okay, it wasn't that big of a crisis, okay. 
uh, on my resolution uh, that 276 Main Street East be designated under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, and that a notice of intention to designate be issued in accordance with the Ontario Heritage Act. A mover. Councillor DeFlavio, thank you. All in favor? That's great, thank you, carried. Next up, designation research report 12, St. Andrews, back to Garrett. Thank you through you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to note that we've met with this property owner as well, and she's very supportive and excited about the designation. And she's uh, also shown interest in encouraging her neighbors on St. Andrews Avenue to, uh, to consider designating their properties as well. Based on the assessment of cultural heritage value or interest, staff recommend that the property at 12 St. Andrews Avenue be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Staff have concluded that the property has met six out of nine prescribed criteria of the Ontario Regulation 906. The property meets the criteria for design and physical value because the structure is a strong example of the arts and crafts style and was constructed by the notable Schaefer brothers. The Schaefers had a reputation within Grimsby for building high quality homes using high end materials and constructed many notable buildings along our streetscapes. The building at 12 St. Andrews has a unique feature. It is an eyebrow window dormer on the second floor, which is not commonly seen within the town. The property meets the criteria for historical and associative value because this was the home of William Schaefer. William's brothers were the Schaefer brothers who were the notable builders and renovators. During the 1920s and 1960s, they were instrumental in creating homes and buildings full of charm and character that Grimsby is known for. William's occupation at the time was listed as a plumber and a beekeeper. The property has many arts and crafts elements characteristic of the Schaefer Brothers building style. The use of quality materials and fine craftsmanship made this historic team very well known and accomplished within Grimsby. The property meets the criteria for contextual value because the Schaefer brothers built the first subdivision in Grimsby beginning in the 1920s. The duo are listed as having built all but two houses on Murray Street. Although their developments on St. Andrews uh, Avenue aren't uh, mentioned as much as Murray Street, they are equally significant. In 1943, the Grimsby Independent article mentions three new homes being constructed by the brothers that same year on this street. Given that at least five of the houses on St. Andrews Avenue were built by the brothers, as well as the subdivision on Nell's Boulevard and most of the houses on Murray Street, the neighborhoods have a visual continuity and coherent look. Not only was 12 St. Andrews Avenue William Schaefer's own home, but it was also just one street over from his brother Harvey Schaefer's home on Nell's Boulevard, as well as his mother's home at 19 Murray Street, situating it in situating it within the personal community of the family members of Grimsby's most prominent developers. Based on the assessment of cultural heritage value or interest and significant findings, staff recommend that the property at 12 St. Andrews Avenue be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, for that presentation. Uh, I'm excited about, about this house. I think it's a really unique, uh, architecturally significant house. Uh, uh, on St. Andrews, so I'm glad it's getting recognition, and it, and it has that like a direct Schaefer connection, not just in the design, but also a family member living there. So that's kind of cool. Uh, any any comments or questions from the committee? Yes, Councillor Flavio, go ahead. Through you, Chair. Um, I don't know how much of the inside you got to see uh, in your exploration, um, but the the Schaefer houses quite often have very uh, distinct built-in type uh, parts to them. So I, I'd love to see, uh, we haven't had doors open in a while. And the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is I'd love to get into some of these houses. We've had Schaefer houses in the past on doors open and they're always very distinct from one another, but you could see the similarities in construction while they're different from one another. So I'd love to get into one of these houses and and, and so uh, doors open, if, if there's something we could do to get that back. Uh, and we, if this homeowner is, is somebody that's interested in promoting heritage, maybe it would be somebody that would be interested in sharing and letting other people see their home so, so that they could see the kind of workmanship that went into these homes. Because it's, 
I mean, you can't you can't describe it without seeing it, but it's so distinct in in, in the styles, and you can tell a Schaefer house when you go into it uh, immediately, and or somebody that tried to copy it, but they're they they look the same, and, and uh, I'm happy that we're we're able to designate this one. Yes, thank you. I, I too would love to, to see that, especially that eyebrow dormer. I'm so intrigued about what that looks like on the inside. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe one day we can add that to a doors open. Uh, and any other comments? Yes, uh, Amy, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, just to kind of echo what Councillor DeFlavio was saying, um, and with doors open, um, Garrett, you were saying um, the level of involvement that the homeowner was showing and how she wanted to encourage other homeowners on the street. Um, I just think it, it opens up like the broader context of having the conversations again, like doors open, but also um, looking at from a social. You Earlier we talked about Heritage Week and the success we had with sharing different historic properties within Grimsby. Um, I personally was following those. I saw the types of engagement. So, you know, looking to testimonials and talking about with the homeowners on a more um, informal uh, basis and getting them to kind of educate um, not only the community but other homeowners and inspire them to move forward with the designation process. Um, that is all. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Garrett, yes, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Chair. You reminded me something of the conversation I had with the property owner about the, the eyebrow window there, and I think it's a, a bit of a testament to the quality that the brothers built the houses to and how important the exterior decoration and style of them was. But uh, the homeowner was telling us that the, the eyebrow dormer window is actually a false window and was never meant to be seen from the outside, but she did, or from the inside, sorry, but she did create an opening so she was able to enjoy it as well. Thank you. That's really interesting. <laughs> uh, and, and just back to Amy's point, like this could also be something that we pursue with, with our education working group, right? Like this could be something that, you know, I don't, again, we'll wait for the working group to see what those ideas are, but I, I think that's having homeowners that are so excited uh, and champions for the designation process and working with the town. Um, I think there's really cool opportunities there. And I think it's also worth noting on like St. Andrews Avenue, like, you know, there are, there have been a couple houses on the street that have experienced some changes too, right? So I, I think it's important to have this conversation with the homeowners about why the, the neighborhood, the context of the neighborhood, um, and that, I can't think of the words right now, but um, that keeping that character is really important. So having those conversations, I think, uh, is, is definitely something that uh, we can continue as, as the Heritage Committee and getting out in the, in the community to do that work. So thank you for bringing that up. Any, any other comments or questions? All right, I'll move on to, uh, to the resolution. Uh, resolved that 12 St. Andrews Avenue be designated under part four, section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, and that a notice of intention to designate be issued in accordance with the Ontario Heritage Act. A mover. Amy, great. All in favor. Awesome, that's carried. Thank you, everyone. Okay, moving on then to the uh, correspondence section of, uh, of tonight's meeting. Uh, we have two correspondence letters, uh, one from the town of Fort Erie and the other from uh, the city of Kitchener, both regarding the ACO request for extension in terms of uh, the, the timeline, the, time, the limit that's been placed on the Municipal Heritage Register. Uh, so we'll go to Bianca to, to share about that correspondence. Uh, thank you, through you, the chair. Um, so as um, the chair said, um, the ACO has put out, the ACO is the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, um, and they have put out a um, request to the province asking for that two-year timeline to be extended to enable uh, municipalities to react to um, the changes. And as we talked earlier, about 38,000 properties within the province are directly impacted by this. And it's just such a, a large volume and a lot of municipalities aren't able to react or have resources to react. Um, so their request is to extend that timeline. Um, and so this request is now circulating, asking the municipalities to back the request. Um, and so these are two letters that were brought forward from Fort Erie and um, the city of Kitchener. And so um, I, 
I would recommend that the committee provides a recommendation to council to endorse it. Um, and then if council does endorse it, then uh, the clerk's department will prepare, prepare the correspondence and share it. So um, that's kind of a summary and I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, thank you for that, Bianca. Uh, Councillor Flavio, go ahead. Through you, Chair. I was going to recommend that we that it be endorsed as well. So, uh, do we need to do that as a committee, or do we? Can I just do that as a councillor at the at, at council? Because either one is fine. I, I'm going to do it whether the committee does it or not. But through the chair, I I think both sounds like it would be good. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely say that um, I think this is important. And I think, yeah, if the, if the committee can have, you know, can support it, then I'd, I'd like us to, to support this. And knowing the amount of work that a town plant, heritage planning staff have been doing uh, to just do what we can to pr protect what we have has been incredible and it's not sustainable. Your workload is not sustainable. <laughs> so if this can extend the deadline of the register and give you breathing room and also give us a sense of like, to reevaluate, um, you know, the impact of, of Bill 23 and what, what these changes are doing to the act, I think that will give us a breathing room to actually act in accordance. So yes, yes, Councilor De Flavio, go ahead. Yeah, through you, Chair, I, I fear that it's gonna fall on deaf ears, but uh, I, I think it's important that we support the, the idea of an extension. Um, the, while the town of Grimsby and our staff has done an exceptional job of bringing forward designations, a lot of municipalities around Ontario, from my understanding, is some have barely even started or don't know where to start uh, in the process. Now, that's not an excuse. Uh, something has, has to be done clearly because this is legislation that's been passed. But giving people an opportunity, whatever opportunity that is, to, by extending this, this deadline to preserve heritage properties uh, is the absolute least that the province should do. And, and so, yeah, I 100% support this. I didn't like the idea of, the, of removing the heritage register in the first place. It was such a simple and uh, important tool. And, and it, I think it's having the opposite effect of what the, the province intended. And that was they wanted to make all these properties properties that were easy to tear down and build on. And what we're doing in the town of Grimsby instead is designating all the properties that, that might have been, you know, that, that were just on the register until further notice. So let that be a lesson to the province. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And again, I think it's a testament to all the work that the town of Grimsby is doing um, in response to into this. So thank you so much to uh, to the heritage planning team for doing that. And I think it's also just worth noting, like the, the heritage register also was like a, an inventory tool for communities who don't have heritage planning staff. So even just to lose that as a tool for these small rural communities, smaller communities up north, like who don't have the staff and don't have committees, like it was just an inventory tool and even that's gone. So if we're able to attempt to extend the register uh, for now, and then maybe in the future we can come up with another solution, uh, that's, but we gotta start somewhere. So I agree, uh, maybe they'll listen if enough communities are, are putting forward these letters. So if we can be a part of that solution, I, I would definitely ask to be that. Uh, Councillor Costanji, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I completely agree with what everybody is saying, actually. Um, also, the cost of communities uh, who don't have heritage staff that now are acquiring them or the extra workload, and then the cost of um, designations and so many designations because of the notice and, and the newspaper and all the workload and stuff like that. So there has been definitely an added cost with the changes as well. I think it's important to note that municipalities are carrying because of this. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I agree that that's an important part of the conversation as well as the, the cost that, that this is burdening in the communities as well. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Bianca, go ahead. I just wanted to add, I know you were saying to staff, but I also wanted to say to the committee council and all of our volunteers, the Grimsby Historical Society, Wayne, and all the community members that have poured out into this. It's been amazing to see everybody just such a united front and um, 
you know, we could do these reports and they could sit on shelves. So it's really, you guys are really making that impact. And so um, I think as a community, it's been amazing to see everyone come together and all of the different sectors really chip in on it. And I think that's why we're seeing such an impact. And then of course, to the homeowners and, you know, it's been really interesting to see and having these discussions one-on-one -on -one with the homeowners and then them hearing like council's plan to preserve the greater community and so many homeowners have bought into that because they love the the community and they want to be a part of it and 12 st andrews had said like how honored she felt that her home was being recognized and we do get that a lot too where they didn't expect their house to be seen and so yeah i think it's just been great from a community perspective to just see everybody coming together so i just wanted to share that Thank you, I appreciate that. That little note of, of goodness. We need more of that, that positivity. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so I guess with if there's no, no other questions or, or comments, I'll move forward to the resolutions. So I need to read them separate because there's one from yeah. Kitchener and one from Fort Erie. And then, so we, we recommend that, well, and then we recommend to council who will endorse the ACO request and then uh, clerks will write up that request and then we'll come back to the committee or it will just go straight to council? It'll go through, um, it'll go, yeah, and then it'll be circulated. Okay, so it sounds like clerks will draft that up, it'll be circulated, sent to account, sent away at wherever it needs to go. Okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. I will then move on to the resolution. Um, so first we'll start with the uh, Town of Fort Erie. So I resolve that the, that the correspondence from the Town of Fort Erie ACO request for extension be received and that the committee recommends that council endorse the ACO request. A mover. Brian. All in favor? Carried. Okay, and then moving on to the next correspondence. Um, resolved that the correspondence from the City of Kitchener ACO request for extension be received and that the committee recommends that council endorse the ACO request. A mover. Amy. All in favor? Carried. Uh, okay, great. So then we'll move on. Um, so I did, I, in this conversation, I did have one quick announcement news to share, I guess. Uh, so I recently um, wrote a journal article for the Brown Homesteads blog um, about the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, reviewing, reflecting on the changes that have been made um, since Bill 23, and just some suggestions of, of maybe ways that we can we can address our approach to heritage, getting that conversation going, um, real, like recognizing uh, the position that uh, the province has put municipalities and communities in with these changes and suggestions of, you know, how can we use this as a tool for, um, for, for positivity and for change, kind of like what Bianca was saying about how here in Grimsby, our experience has been um, an increase in designations and an increase of collaboration with the community as we preserve heritage. So if anyone's interested in reading that journal article, if you head over to the Brown Homestead website and you go look for journal and it should be right there, the first one, it's called Ontar uh, Reviewing the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, I encourage you to give it a read, um, give your thoughts. I'm always interested in hearing and kind of e expanding that dialogue. So I just wanted to share it out there as members of the heritage community, <laughs> just in case you're interested in, but if you have any questions now or, yeah. Uh, I think with that, I think we're good to uh, conclude the meeting tonight. I thank you for some really, uh, really valuable conversation. I, it was really great to, to have so much interaction uh, with the public today. So thank you. And I hope everyone has a really great night. <laughs>